as India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi embarks on a state visit to Washington, which will also entail an address to a joint meeting of Congress on June 22nd, U.S.-India relations remain on an upward trajectory that began in 2000. Close to a quarter century later, short of India becoming a formal ally of the United States, it has established itself as one of America's most consequential global partners, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, where its increasingly assertive neighbor, China, is flexing its muscles. To understand what the Modi visit means for U.S.-India relations, my Shah report spoke to Arun Kumar Singh, a former Indian ambassador to Washington, as well as a seasoned diplomat with many crucial assignments in a career spanning decades. Arun Kumar Singh spoke to MCR from New Delhi. Uh, Mr. Singh, what's your overall view of uh, India-U.S. relations since 2014, particularly as they have gone through three presidents, Obama, Trump, and Biden. You presented your credentials to President Obama in 2015. Uh, how do you see the trajectory in the, since you were here and perhaps even before that? So, Mike, I would start uh, looking at the new phase in India-US relations uh, since 2000. Uh, that's when President Clinton visited India. And it was a clear indicator that the US was moving away from how they had reacted to our 1998 nuclear tests and the sanctions they had imposed. Uh, you'd recall that at that time, they had been very strident in their criticism, very, very critical. But still, President Clinton tasked his Deputy Secretary of State, Strobe Talbot, to get into a deep dive discussion with India about what are our strategic compulsions, priorities, if they could explore convergence. And from the Indian side, the Prime Minister had mandated Mr. Jaswan Singh, who later became the Foreign Minister, the Finance Minister, the Defence Minister at various times. Now, through those discussions, uh, you know, they met, uh, I understand, some 14 times, spread over a period of 18 months, 10 different countries. There was a far deeper understanding between the two sides of how they saw their role in the world, what could be the opportunity for cooperation. And that led to the Clinton visit. And so since then, I think step by step, with each president, the relationship has evolved. Now you had a Democratic Clinton who starts the process. Then you had a Republican George Bush uh, who uh, really advanced it through the transformational civil nuclear cooperation agreement. And I recall that when uh, President Bush was still in the campaign phase, speaking at the Reagan National Library in November 1999, he said that there is one country that doesn't get enough attention, and that is India. And India will be a force in the world. And then he tasked his administration to really find ways of advancing the India relationship. And you'd recall that when our Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, met him in September 2008, was the end of George Bush's tenure. And he said that when history is written, it will be recorded that George W. Bush played a major role in transforming the relations between the two democracies. And after that, we had President Obama, to whom I had the occasion uh, and the honor to present my credentials. And President Obama took several steps. He was the first US president to visit India twice. He was the first US president to visit India on our Republic Day as chief guest in 2015. And no U.S. president had done that before that. He articulated support for India's permanent membership of the U.N. Security Council. He declared India a major defense partner. And he invited Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in 2009 as the first state visitor of the Obama administration. And as you know, in the U.S., state visits are a rare thing. They do maximum right. two or three uh, every year. In fact, Joe Biden has done three altogether in the first two and a half years of his uh, presidency. So those were important signals. Now, after President uh, Obama, we had President Trump, many, in many ways a maverick, very unpredictable. But he sustained the India relationship. He put India on strategic trade authorization level one, the same level of technology releases that the US done, does for its closest allies uh, and partners, including uh, NATO allies. And then you'd recall that he joined the Indian prime minister in Houston in September 2009 at a rally of 50,000 Indian Americans. Now, it's very unusual for a US yeah. president to join a visiting leader 
in a rally meant for that visiting leader. But he, but he did so. Again, a civil signal uh, to the relationship. And so from there, if you look at where we are under President Joe Biden, the relationship has continued to advance. Uh, President Trump had, for example, uh, reactivated the court of India, Japan, Australia, and the US, first with official and then ministerial level meetings. Joe Biden took it to a summit level meeting. And they've met at the summit level several times, including recently when they were in Hiroshima uh, for the G7 uh, meeting. And under his presidency, they've started a new grouping called the I2U2, right. India, Israel, UAE, and US. Now, a recognition by the US and a signal by the US that it sees India as a partner, not just in the bilateral context, but in many other multilateral formats in different regions of the world. And so that's a new signal uh, from the US. <clears throat> and then in January this year, the National Security Advisors of India and the US launched a major new initiative on critical and emerging technologies, talking about artificial intelligence, quantum, cyber, 6G, semiconductors, defense technology, commercialization of space, and saying that they want to build a new framework of partnerships in these areas, which are going to completely transform the way we live, the way we work. And so build new partnerships, create new opportunities for skills. Now, in the framework of all that, uh, President Biden has now invited the Indian Prime Minister to come to the US on June 22, 23, uh, for a state visit. Now, that's a very high level of protocol, and the Indian Prime Minister, as I mentioned, will be only the third state visitor in two and a half years of the Obama administration, of the Biden administration, of the President Macron in December, the right. South Korean president in April this year. And also, President, uh, Prime Minister Modi will be only the third Indian leader ever invited to the US on a state visit. We had Dr. Radha Krishnan in 1963. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in 2009 and Prime Minister Modi. And it has just been announced that uh, he is also going to be addressing a joint session of the US Congress on June 22nd. Now, that means he'll be doing it uh, the second time. He did so in 2016, and that also is unusual. So, if based on what I've you know, described for you, uh, the top line developments, right. it's clear that with each president, Republican or Democrat, since 2000, the relationship has continued to advance on an accelerating upward trajectory. Right. Now, it's an interesting segue for me because uh, the fact that they've just announced that uh, Prime Minister Modi will address a joint session of Congress, uh, people forget that the same uh, Mr. Modi couldn't visit for 10 years. Uh, and uh, when the Biden administration came into office, there were uh, serious concerns that given their almost a reflexive obsession with human rights issues of the Democratic Party. People are worried how the relations between uh, uh, Joe Biden and Narendra Modi might pan out, but it seems that's his history now. Nobody remembers that. Do you think that's a, a, an accurate sense of it? Well, let me put it this way, that uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi was the chief minister in Gujarat, uh, there were certain uh, approaches in the US uh, towards his visiting the U.S., there was some opposition. But once he was elected the prime minister, I think the U.S. took the call that he is the elected leader of a major democratic country, and uh, they have to accept the outcome of elections. You know, even in the U.S., they have they say that elections have consequences, right. and so they have to accept the outcome of the elections and deal with the elected leader of India uh, in that right. And so uh, I think President Obama um, in 2014. Uh, took a very conscious decision that when the Indian Prime Minister was visiting for the UN General Assembly in September that year, uh, also invited him to Washington uh, for a bilateral right. meeting. Uh, and so I think from that uh, phase on, clearly uh, the past was behind uh, in terms of how US looked at the India relationship or uh, the role of Mr. Modi as the Prime Minister. And since then he's visited uh, US on several occasions for bilateral meetings, for multilateral events, where he's had bilateral meetings with US presidents. And, uh, you know, now on a state visit, uh, going to be speaking to the, the joint session of Congress twice. So these are very right. important signals of how they are consolidating the relationship. How much of this is uh, driven by 
the US is well known utilitarian impulses when it comes to dealing with uh, countries around the world. Uh, they see a rather aggressive uh, rise of China, which is now indeed a global player. Uh, and that's perhaps guiding some of, some of the impulses that uh, Biden and Washington are showing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the prime minister and, and India. Do you think that there is an element of that as well? Look, my, my view is that having dealt with foreign relations now for nearly four decades, international relations, every country is utilitarian. No country in the world uh, chooses, makes a foreign policy decision really to help another country. They see where is the convergence of interest and what is the advantage to them from building that relationship. And so every country does that. And we have to uh, advance our cooperation, uh, exploring the convergence. Now, you know, I have now studied the India-US relations very closely for quite some time. And I've found that uh, four factors have impacted the US approach to India. One is what is the broad US global priority at a point of time? Second, within the framework of that priority, what is the US relationship with Pakistan? Because then that impacts on India. Again, within the framework of that global priority, what is the US relationship with China? Because that also impacts on India. And finally, what is the strength in the bilateral relationship? Therefore, who are the stakeholders in the US? that are invested in advancing the relationship and protecting the various dimensions of the relationship. So when you look at these four factors, I think you can explain the uh, relationship, the dynamics of the relationship at any point of time. Now, given that in today's context, the US has said repeatedly, they see China as their main challenge. They see China as the only country with the economic, technological and military combined capability and the intent of replacing the US in the international system. So they have to respond to that. And they are building partnerships um, uh, and working out strategy to deal with that challenge. And in this framework, they certainly see India as an important partner. And again, if you look at the uh, statements and messages coming out from the US, they understand that even if India is not overtly anti-China, because India will take its decisions in its own interest, then a strong India in its own right is a deterrent to China's unilateral and aggressive posturing or assertive uh, steps that China has been taking, for example, in East China Sea, South China Sea, along the LSE uh, with India. <clears throat> and beyond that, of course, are the strengths in the bilateral relationship. You know, the India-US trade today is $191 billion. It has increased about eight times in the last 20 years. U.S. is our largest trading partner. Uh, India is an important trading partner for the U.S. And if you look at the Silicon Valley, you know, when I was in the U.S., I visited Silicon Valley several times and I could see that Indian origin tech entrepreneurs, Indian origin tech workers were an integral part of U.S. global leadership in innovation, including in digital technologies. So they also recognize the value of this partnership. So I think all these factors uh, come into play as they look at the India relationship, as they want to advance it. And certainly the challenge they see from China is one of the important factors in this. In, in specific terms, just as uh, the 2005-2008 civil nuclear deal was seen as a, a, a major, <laughs> major milestone, there are expectations that uh, a new milestone would be created when very likely uh, the transfer of F-414 jet engine engine production to India uh, is likely to be announced on this visit. Do you see this as a comparable milestone or uh, you see it in a, in a different way? So Mike, I think a new milestone has already been created and the F414, if it works out, will be a subset of that milestone. And the new milestone that was created was done in January this year uh, when the two national security advisors uh, met in Washington and launched this new initiative on critical and emerging technologies. Right. And I think uh, the broad assessment was that these technologies, and everybody says that, that there's a perfect storm of technology coming. They are going to transform the way we live, the way we work. Uh, in these areas, work is just uh, starting. And so far, uh, while there's growing strategic convergence between India and the US, and we spoke about that, the economic and technological dimension of the partnership needs further strengthening. 
you know, for example, as I mentioned, our trade is about $191 billion. But the China-US trade is $750 billion. So right. you can see the difference that is there. Uh, and yet at the same time, when over the past few years, we have tried to work out limited trade agreements. Even there, we've not been able to succeed. You know, the, for example, Indian ministers and others said in 2018 that a limited trade agreement is going to happen soon. Now, even till now, we've not had it. That's because there are existing interests on both sides. That when a, and you have to make concessions that block the concessions. Uh, so I think the idea is to create new framework for cooperation, new framework for production sharing, and from that lead to new kind of trading patterns that strengthen the partnership. So I think it is with this in mind uh, that uh, the two leaders, uh, the two national security advisors launched this initiative where they'll be looking at partnership in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, cyber, 6G, semiconductors, commercialization of space, defense technologies, and that's where the G right. uh, engine comes in. Because the first reference to the US trying to expedite the processing of the G engine uh, transfer uh, happened in the White House statement that was put out in January this year, after the meeting of the two NSAs on critical and emerging right. technology. And again, this is very important because so far, India and the US have done a fair amount of cooperation in science and technology. But most of it, for example, in science was cooperation in science with the perspective of science. And then there were diplomatic spin-offs. Now the message is from both sides that we want to partner in technology from the national security perspective, that, that we believe it is in our interest from the national security perspective to deepen technology partnerships and to move to a higher level of technology partnership. Now, at a time when you're seeing that the US is restricting technology right. access for China on national security grounds, on India, the message is on national security grounds, we move, want to move to a higher level of partnership. Now, I think once this message comes out at the level of national security advisors, at the level of leaders, then the businesses in both countries, the academia in both countries, will be enthused to explore partnerships in these areas. Otherwise, they would want to be reassured that when they move ahead with partnership in these areas, later the governments don't tell them to back down. And so the signal is move ahead. We are, we are behind this. Right. So I think that next big thing, the framework for that has already been created. Uh, the G engine would be an element of that. And from what I understand, after January this year, uh, the various uh, bilateral groups that had been set up in the framework of partnership in critical and emerging technologies have had meetings and they're trying to see what could be the next steps for this. And I'm sure there will, there will be references uh, to potential in this area, work that should be done in whatever cuts out after the meeting between the Prime Minister and the President. Right. Uh, given the diversity of uh, economic, technological, strategic, military convergences that you just enlisted, do you, do you think it's time for India perhaps to become a formal ally of the U.S.? It, that's not the case so far. And I know it's not just up to India to do it, but do you think the two countries should look at uh, that as a possible objective or it's, it's of no particular consequence? No, I think we should not do that. Uh, and I'll, there are various reasons for that. You know, uh, at one level, India wants to maintain the strategic autonomy of its decision making. And that's very important. Uh, there is growing convergence between India and the US. There is growing strength in the bilateral uh, partnership. But India's geographic location is different. Uh, India's historical experience is different. So there will not always be 100% convergence. So for example, on China, we see some convergence. But on Pakistan and Afghanistan, we don't see 100% convergence. And then the US withdrew in 2021 from Afghanistan out of their own compulsions. They did not factor in what would be the impact on countries in the neighborhood, including India. And so we have to understand that you know each country is driven by its own assessment of security consideration, its own domestic political compulsion. Now, recently, for example, the US has authorized a $450 million sustainment package for F-16s in Pakistan. Now, from the US perspective, perhaps it makes sense they want to retain some access to the Pakistani leadership, particularly in the military. Uh, they want to signal that once they supply a platform, they try and retain its efficiency. But from Indian perspective, that's a negative development because eventually, which is the country that Pakistan uses F-16s against? It is India. 
so so what we have to understand that there will never be a 100% convergence in compulsions or national security consideration of all countries secondly you've been in the us and you have watched processes in the us us decisions are based on their own assessments of their own interests and political compulsions of the leaders now where of course there's convergence for a country like india you, know, you work together so i think uh, the india us relationship can be sustained even better if we are not a formal ally and right. if both of us allow space for differences from time to time now i think uh, for example the us i believe has handled very well the fact that india does not agree or has not gone along 100% with the us position in the context of the russia ukraine conflict because india has a legacy relationship with russia uh, we still have 60% of our defense inventory of russian origin historically the soviet union and russia have been supportive of us politically when we were under pressure from the west and so so the us you know factor that in and the secretary of state has said on a number of occasions that you know uh, in russia became a partner of india of a kind when us was not willing to be that kind of a partner indeed, or, yeah. or the national security adviser said that with india we are playing the long game so i think both of us have to allow space for some differences uh, in the options but look at the longer term convergence the longer term benefits and work on that basis uh, right. that's why i believe that if we retain this option of differences from time to time it will give more stability uh, to the relationship yeah. the predominant sense in the aftermath of the us withdrawal from afghanistan is that uh, the so called hyphenated approach that washington had vis-a-vis -vis islamabad and new delhi has almost completely uh, now it's tilting towards new delhi as as we just discussed uh, do you think that uh, and, and also add to that the, the fact that pakistan is firmly in the chinese orbit now uh, do you think that hyphenated approach is history i think the hyphenated approach is history and the process started again in 2000 when bill clinton came to india uh, for example in 2000 he was here for around 5 days on his way back he stopped for a couple of hours in pakistan uh, so so you know that that differentiation started and now when us leaders presidents and others come to india they don't necessarily uh, visit pakistan so that the and again um, you know the fact that us did a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with india in 2008 and has not done any such thing with pakistan was a recognition from their side that they saw india as a nuclear, as a responsible Uh, country in terms of advanced nuclear technology, and that India had not built up its ca capabilities based on inward or outward proliferation, whereas Pakistan had indulged in inward and outward proliferation of nuclear technology. So, so that dehydration really has happened uh, quite significantly. I think uh, what is still there is that uh, uh, no, they see Pakistan as a country that has nuclear capability. has nuclear weapons and therefore they feel that they must have continue to have some access to the pakistani leadership even if pakistan is in the chinese camp and even if on us china issues given a choice pakistan will be with china secondly the afpak region still continues to be a region of concern as far as terrorism is uh, involved and the us uh, from all reports uh, still sends drones over afghanistan and for that the the country that they need to fly over is pakistan there's no other way they can reach afghanistan so for these various reasons uh, the us needs access to pakistan therefore they'll maintain a relationship from time to time you know they will try to do things to in a sense in inverted commas reward the pakistani military for the support that they're given hence the sustainment package uh, but the dehyphenation has happened i think the us india relationship has really, really moved to another level Uh, in terms of economic technology and the people to people dimension uh, right. of the partnership you know we have 4 million indian americans in the us and finally to conclude uh, in the specific context of the existential crisis in pakistan uh, and given the fact that it's a nuclear weapon state and this kind of instability is definitely a matter of grave concern not just for india but even the us 
How do you see Pakistan? Where do you think it's headed? I know uh, you may not have particularly focused lately on that, but overall, what's your sense sitting in the neighborhood? You know, uh, man, for about 10 years of my career, uh, uh, till about yes. 2005, I was involved in uh, handling uh, India's relations with Pakistan and I've watched the processes in that country. Uh, well, clearly they're going through a difficult time. You know, uh, the army has been the dominant force in Pakistan uh, since its, virtually since its independence. For 60% of the time they rule directly, rest of the time they rule behind the scenes. Uh, from time to time, political leaders have emerged that have challenged the army, but eventually the army has worked uh, to remove them from the scene. Uh, Zulfiqar Albi Bhutto challenged the Pakistan army, they eventually hanged him. Uh, Nawaz Sharif was initially a creature of the Pakistan army uh, and the ISI and presence here. And eventually he took on the Pakistan army uh, and they did a coup against him. Uh, Imran Khan was built up by the Pakistan army. Uh, to keep Nawaz Sharif in check and then the political leaders once they become come in a seat of power you know develop their own motivations and compulsions and then Imran Khan has begun challenging the, the army now this time uh, for various reasons at the popular level it did command some support but as it, and so the army uh, its ability to take him on immediately uh, was not so effective but if you see since then Step by step, they've taken measures to weaken him. Many of his close partners, political allies, are abandoning him. And so clearly what the army will try to do is weaken him, uh, delegitimize him, and once again re-establish itself as the, the commanding force uh, within Pakistan politically. So that's where it seems for now. Uh, but Pakistan is going through a very difficult economic situation. And, right. and that's because you know large part of their budget still goes to the army. Uh, and the army wants to control politics uh, to keep getting this huge chunk of the Pakistani budget. So yeah. that's an important challenge that they face. Uh, just one fine point that I forgot to mention. Uh, Rahul Gandhi, on his current visit, he said it twice in the context of Ukraine-Russia standoff that he his government's policy would be very similar to what uh, the Prime Minister uh, Modi's uh, policy has been. So there's, there is still uh, that political consensus in India when it comes to Russia. No, I think two things. One, there is a consensus in India about maintaining the autonomy of our decision making. And that's a very firm. The moment I feel that there's ever a perception in India that India is subjugating its decision making to another country, there'll be a huge blowback for that relationship. Therefore, this perception that India is able to take decision in its own interest and so on that, that's a very important factor. There's a broad consensus on that. And the second, there is a sense in India that, look, uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia were with us at times when others were not with us. And therefore, you can't uh, ignore that. And then beyond that, ultimately, every country looks at an issue from its own perspective. Right. Uh, and, and therefore, certainly, uh, the Prime Minister told President Putin that this is not an era of war. Um, certainly, uh, India has taken repeatedly the position that it supports the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries. Uh, right. But beyond that, given our own relationship with Russia, uh, it doesn't make sense for us to get publicly into condemnation or criticism of Russia or voting against Russia. Uh, because again, uh, on the uh, India-China issue, it's important for us to prevent Russia from going over to China on India-China issues. Right. And uh, so that's, again, a very important consideration. On that note, uh, Mr. Singh, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully someday soon we'll talk about uh, the neighborhood at, in, at greater length. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I'll send you the link, I think, sometime by tomorrow or over the weekend. And uh, wonderful to meet you finally. I mean, I've been uh, tracking your work for quite some time, so I'm aware of what you do, but we never met before. Well, thanks, Matt. I look forward to being in touch. And thank you for conducting this conversation very effectively and keeping oh, wonderful. the questions.